Thank you for the introduction. So uh, in this talk today, I'll talk to you about our recent advances in program synthesis using confid driven learning. So this is joint work with UFANC that just finished his PhD at UT Austin, and will be joining UC Santa Barbara in 2019, and with Arthur Bastani, which uh, is currently at MIT, but actually will be joining PAN in the next weeks, and initially league at UT Austin. So let's start. So what is program synthesis? So the idea is that you give some specification P, and then your program synthesizer will take these specifications and will build you a program P that for all inputs of that program will meet that specification you gave him. So this specification can either be formal, let's say using a mathematical formulation, or can be informal, for example, using input-output examples. So there's been a, a lot of advances in program synthesis in the last decade or last years even. Uh, and let's say the use of uh, program synthesis in flash field at Microsoft Research was, I guess, one of the big success in industry. But even after that, and every year, there's a constant uh, improvement of the algorithms to use for program synthesis. So you can use, let's say, deduction to prune the search space, or you can use types, uh, or you can use refinement types to prune the search space, and dividing, you can use enumerative search, or more recently, let's say, you can use machine learning to actually find the problem you want to, uh, to find. So even though there's a lot of, of work in program synthesis, I would say that you can cluster mostly in three main approaches. You either do enumerative search, constraint solving, and stochastic search. However, all these approaches actually have a common shortcoming. They are not able to learn from previous failures. So let's say you reach a state that you know that th there's no solution to this. You can't actually learn from it. So our question is, can we actually learn from these past mistakes and use that information to not make the same type of mistake over and over again? And what do I mean by learning from mistakes? So here I'm just giving you a very small example, motivation example. So the idea is that let's say you have a list as input, one, two, three, and you just want to have your output list to be one, two. So, and now let's say the program synthesizer is searching for the solution and he decided to try to use map of that input list. And of course, map would have some other parameters, but in this case, it doesn't really matter. So what it matters is that if you just apply map directly to your input list, you will never get the output list. Why? because map preserves the, the, the list size, right? So since the input list has size three and the output list has size two, if you actually apply map to it, you, it will never work, right? But can you actually use this to learn some information about it? Can you, in more general terms, can you actually learn that, well, actually it's not only map that doesn't work. Any function f that would either preserve or increase the size of the list will have the same issue, right? So we will actually not be able to give you the solution you want. So the idea is, can we actually learn from these mistakes? And instead of trying all possible combinations that have the same issue, can we have like a way that we can prune several problems at the same time? So let's say if map doesn't work, we also could learn that, well, reverse and sort will not work as well because they, they also like maintain the, the, the size of the list. And in this talk, I'll tell you how you can do this. So we propose this conflict-driven synthesis that combines uh, different modules. So we have a search model with this enumerative search where you use machine learning to guide it. Then we have a check conflict uh, model where we're gonna check if for your partial program, is there a feasible completion to that program that may lead to the solution or not. And if there's no, no conflict, then we will continue search. If there's a conflict, we are able to learn from that mistake so that we can avoid similar mistakes in the future. And we do this until we actually find a synthesized code. And I'll explain each of these boxes in more detail throughout the talk. So I'll use this running example, since I'm a soccer fan and it's World Cup. Uh, it's gonna be about soccer, kinda. So it's like compute the scores of the best K teams of a soccer league. So in other words, I want a function, compute K sum, that takes as input at least an integer, and then returns an integer. So let's say you have this list there, X1, that has the scores of all the, your teams of a soccer league. And I want to compute the, the, the score of the best two teams. So in this case, basically, I want my output to be 158, which, which will be 82 plus 76, right? So how can we do that? So for that, let me first introduce a very small domain-specific language that I'll show you how we will be able to learn over this language. And of course, our program synthesizer could have any arbitrary DS, the DSL and can be much more complex than this one. So here we have many different operators. So we have some operators that return you an integer, and this can be like constants, like zero to 10. It can be the input, and it can be like last and a half that will return you the last element of a list or the first element of a list. Or you can, you can have other operators that operate over lists and return you a list. For example, take takes the list as input and an integer number n, and will return you a sublist with the first n elements of that list. 
Other examples could be, like, say, a filter predicate, where you take as input the list and a predicate t, and then, in this case, the predicate t's we are considering are greater or equal than zero, less or equal than zero, and equal to zero. And then you will return your list after, after filtering it with this predicate. And you, of course, you can have many other operators like sort, reverse, or the input list. So how would we solve this compute case sum using this very basic DSL? So let's assume our sorting function is very basic and it only sorts in ascending order. So I will need to first sort in ascending order. Then now, since I want to actually sort in, in descending order, I will need to reverse it. And afterwards, I will take the first x2 elements of it and then sum those elements. And this will be the solution for my compute case sum problem. Throughout this talk, I'll, I'll see programs as trees. So I'll present the problem as an abstract syntax tree. And this means that each node will have a label associated to it, which is basically the decision that we make for that node. Note that at the root of the tree, we have the outputs of our program. And at the leaf of the trees, we have the inputs of our program. We can also have partial programs. And why is a partial program? Well, a partial program is a program that for some nodes, we don't know exactly yet what we're going to put there. So there are still some unknowns, and we need to decide upon them. So let's start explaining our conflict-driven synthesis framework with the search engine. Okay, so what is the goal of the search engine? Is Let's say we have a tree. The goal is for each node in the tree, we want to actually assign a value to that node that corresponds to a function. So we want to choose a component to each node of the program. How we do that? Well, we're actually using machine learning algorithms that people have done in the past, like ngrams or neural networks. And the idea is that, well, we're, most of the synthesis task is solving problems that other people have solved in the past. So we want to learn from large corpora so that we can take advantage of advances in machine learning. So let's say you have this example here, the compute case sum problem. So again, we have this input list and this output list, uh, output integer. And you can notice that, well, this integer is actually larger than any of the integers in the input. So maybe the machine learning algorithm will be able to figure out that, well, I need to pick some components for my root level that makes these numbers go larger. And I'll, I'm going to try some. So of course, this is a guess. And, uh, but it's based on learning from large corpora. So we're, we're hoping that this is a good guess. So what is the downside of just using enumerative search is that uh, we, we can only actually know if this is the correct problem or not once we have a full program. So only once we have a full program, we can either run over the input-output examples of our system, or we can give it to a verifier to actually check if this is actually the correct program. So the question is, can we do better than this? Can we actually know that it doesn't matter how I'm going to feel n1, maybe I can actually derive that there's no possible completion to this partial program that will lead to a solution. So, and the answer is yes, we can do that. And we can do it by checking. Every time we have a partial program, we want to check if there's a conflict or not. So the goal of, of checking a conflict is basically you want to prune the search space, in this case using imprecise specifications, so that we don't have to wait until we have a full program. So why precise, imprecise specifications? Sometimes it can be very hard to precisely capture what a component must do, right? So, so some, some functions may be very hard actually to describe in mathematical terms. But if you actually just use simple properties that over approximate the behavior of that component, let's say for least properties, we can say, well, I don't really know what this operator is going to do, but I know what happens after I use it with respect to size or with respect to the maximum element of, of my list, right? So how can we do that in, in practice? So let's say our filter predicate here. So our filter, filter predicate takes as input a list and a predicate t. And you can say, well, after applying this filter predicate, uh, I have this y that represents the output list and the x1 that represents the input list. So I can say, well, my output list size is going to be either the same or smaller than my, than my input list. And for the maximum, you can also say, well, the maximum is either going to be the same or it's going to decrease, right? Because now you have a sublist of the original list. And you can do the same for all the other specifications uh, or components. So in this case, for example, take, we can say, so take again, remember, recall that take takes a list and an integer n and we're turning the sublist with the first n elements. So here you can say, well, I know that the size of this list is either going to decrease or be the same as before. And again, I know the maximum is either decrease or be the same as before. And you can do this reasoning for all your components in your DSL. So how can you use this imprecise specifications to prune the search base? So let's assume now that I have this partial problem here on the right. So this is, I'm, a, I'm trying to solve this problem again of compute case sum, and I have this input and this output. And I want to figure out if there's a possible completion for this node N3 and N5 that actually lead to, will lead to a solution. So my first step is I, I just basically 
put all my imprecise specifications for each node, and then I can join them. So now I have a constraint system, which I can give you to a constraint solver and to know if it's feasible or not. So the constraint solver, basically for this problem, will say, well, this system is actually infeasible, and the reason of infeasibility is because of the constraints highlighted in red. And if we take a closer look to the program that we're trying to do, we can see that filter, take, and have all have this property that the maximum value is either going to be equal or smaller than before. But since the, our output integer 158 is larger than any of the integers on the input list, we know that this is not, not going to work, right? So can you actually uh, take this insight longer? So before that, the good thing about this is that a partial problem represents many complete programs. So it's good that you're backtracking before we actually have a complete program. But we're still only proning one partial problem at a time, right? And we, what we really want to do is, can we learn this reason of infeasibility here, pinpoint the cause of the problem, and actually learn equivalent infeasible partial problems as well? And that's what our learn from conflict box does. And here, what we do is, the goal is to learn other equivalent infeasible partial programs. So we have this very important notion that we introduced in the paper, which we call equivalent model conflict. So what, what does this mean? So two components, x and x prime, are equivalent model conflicts at the given node, n. If replacing x with x prime will lead to the same conflict. So now that we have some intuition, why is this? And I'll give an example next. Also, we have the problem of how we can detect this automatically. So let's go back to our, to our problem. So we know that this partial problem is uh, infeasible. And the reason of infeasibility is because of those constraints are in red. So now let's take one, one of those nodes. Let's take N1, for example. So the question now is, can I replace take with another operator that will lead to the same issue as before? So what was the reason that take contributed for the unsatisfiable root cause was because it says, well, the maximum element of the input list, of the output list, is going to be less or equal than the input list, right? So if you look at other components that, that may share the same behavior, like sort, reversal, filter, none of them actually increase the maximum element of the list. So you, you, can, you could actually say, if I would replace take by any of those other components, I will actually get to the same issue. And this is actually the main motivation behind equivalent model conflict is if I have a component x prime that implies x, then I can say that x and x prime are equivalent model conflict at that node. So at node n1, I can say that this partial problem here is actually equivalent to this other partial problem, and to this one, and to this one. Uh, so as you can see, we're actually now learning not just that one partial problem is infeasible, we're actually learning that a set of partial problems is infeasible. So if you do the same reasoning for all the nodes in our uh, tree, you can actually get that we would uh, exclude 64 other, or 63 other partial programs, 64 in total. So learning is really powerful because it avoids us to e e explore similar mistakes in the future. OK, let's step back and go again again uh, and see again how our framework works in more detail. So let's say we start by doing a search. So I pick a node, let's say my root node, N0. And I don't know what I'm going to assign to it, so I need to pick a value to it. So I'm going to use machine learning to actually decide on a component to be my root component. So let's say I chose half. Now I have a partial program. Now I, I ask the question, is there a way that I can fill the rest of this tree such that I'll get to the solution? So I'll check if there's a conflict or not. So in this case, there's actually no conflict. So I go back, back again, and I do more search. So that means that now I need to pick N1, and I'll choose again another value for that node. And I repeat this process until I have uh, a partial program that will actually lead me to a conflict. So in this case, we have a conflict, because this is the example we've seen before. And now I can learn something from it. So in this case, we, as we've seen, take is actually at node n1 is actually equivalent as having sort there or reverse or filter. So you, you can replace any of those components by, by the other, and you actually have the same core issue. So I can learn all that, and we can block a set of partial programs at one go. Then again, we go back, we, this, we put this in our knowledge base, we backtrack, and we continue doing search. And we do this until either there's no solution, or until we find the synthesized problem we're looking for. OK, so our experimental evaluation. Um, so we evaluate our 
our uh, general framework in two domains, the list domain and the table domain. But here, I'm just going to show you the list domain, so we have more results in the paper. So for the list domain, we compare against DeepCoder, which is a list manipulation synthesizer from Microsoft Research. And they use deep learning to guide the search. Since DeepCoder is actually not publicly available, we contacted the, we contacted the authors and we re-implemented their statistical model in our conflict-driven synthesis framework uh, with close collaboration with, with the authors. So it's, we try to be as close as possible. And as benchmarks, we used the 100 more challenging benchmarks described in their paper. So our general framework is called NEO. And here I'm going to show you how it compares against DeepCoder and what is the impact of each of the components in our system. So in the x-axis, we have time. And we impose a limit of five minutes or 300 seconds for each synthesis task. So if we can't solve the problem in five minutes, we just say we have a timeout. For the y-axis, we, sh we show the percentage of benchmarks solved within that time frame. So as, as a baseline, we have our enumeration algorithm that basically is just this search with no machine learning or no deduction or no learning. So here we can solve around 20% 20, 20 of the benchmarks in five minutes. So if we add machine learning, which basically corresponds to the deep coder approach, we can actually solve around 30% of the benchmarks. So that, that means that actually by guiding the search using machine learning algorithms, we are more likely to succeed. So now what happens if in, on top of this, we actually use deduction to prune the search base before actually getting to a complete program. So when we do that, we have this uh, line here at yellow, and here we can see something interesting. So with deduction, we can actually solve much more than without deduction, but there's a trade-off, right? Because since to do deduction, I need to do a lot of queries to a constraint solver. And there are some costs on those queries. So for easy benchmarks, those, uh, issuing a lot of those queries actually slows down the system. But for hard problems, we can actually sol solve them more efficiently, and, and that's why we can actually solve more. So now what happens if we have the full NEO framework, which combines machine learning, deduction, and learning? Uh, so that will correspond to this orange line, which we have NEO. And here we can see that not, not only we can actually solve much more benchmarks, we are much faster on doing so. So learning is really a powerful technique. So the good news is that we have speed ups over 15 times uh, for some benchmarks when we compare uh, machine learning plus deduction versus machine learning plus deduction and learning. And problems that took 45 minutes to be solved before can now actually be solved in three minutes. So it's really a very powerful technique. So in this talk, I present uh, this very generic framework, NEO, that can be instantiated with any DSL. And the idea is that we combine three main components. Search, by using machine learning algorithms. Then we combine uh, check conflict stage, where we are able to prune partial problems uh, before you actually get to a complete problem by using logical deduction. And we have learning, uh, allow us to learn from previous mistakes, generalize that, and actually avoid making the same mistake over and over again. So some concluding, concluding thoughts. Uh, there are other areas where learning actually has a huge impact. And one of them is actually constraint solving, and SAT solving in particular. So before, the early two, before 2000, uh, SAT solving was actually seen as intractable, and it was a really hard problem to solve. But nowadays, everyone is using SNT solving and SAT solving, and this is part of, of their uh, research. And the reason why is because conflict-driven clause learning actually changed the field. Basically, it made make things that we could only solve, let's say, for 100 variables. Now we can solve millions of variables, right? So the, what I, I ask you and, and what I think is going to happen for problems is that this is just the first step towards using learning, right? So this is like still preliminary work. We already have very good results. But can we actually do the same as learning this for start solving? Can we actually push the boundaries of learning in program synthesis? And can we actually increase the scalability of program synthesizers? Uh, and we're not there yet, but I believe that if we actually improve our learning mechanisms, we can actually get there in the future. So if you're building a problem synthesizer, I think, think about learning. It can actually change your life. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, nice talk. Uh, that's a nice technique. But I'm just wondering why you chose this set of benchmarks. So for syntax guided synthesis, we have like over 2,000 benchmarks. And lots of techniques have been implemented. So it 
uh, did, did you try running this method on, on those benchmarks? Yeah, so, so I know that you have like the CQS competition, for example, right, where you have a lot of benchmarks and other domains. Uh, and the reason we chose these benchmarks was uh, well, we have the least, the table. So we wanted to have benchmarks that were more complex in the sense that it's hard actually to describe the precise functionality of a function. So in the CQS competition, for starters, you actually have the full specification <laughs> of each function, right? So here we're using this notion of imprecise specifications. And we can show that we can learn even if you don't have those precise specifications. So it's true that we could also extend our work to uh, tackle the cycles benchmarks. We didn't do, we have not done yet, but we, that's what we're planning to do and hopefully we'll enter the competition in the future as well. Uh, thank okay. you very much. Thanks. Uh, Xu Jie from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, so the first question is, uh, so here the conflict it seems like a certain kind of hand engineer features like a size and a maximum. I wonder if there are general approach to formalize what can be learned from mistake. So here, do you have any other examples besides size, maximum? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, so in, in our tool, we actually use more properties in this. But to be honest, we actually only use five properties for those results. So we only use uh, maximum, minimum, size, first and last element of the list. And this is enough to learn to learn a lot of, of things that are able to backtrack and to prune the search base. So it's true that the learning is associated with, with the properties. And now we're in the dark, but, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, but uh, but we, we didn't actually fine tune the, the, these properties. So we actually are using very basic properties. And I believe that if you actually would synthesize, I guess, which are the features you want or synthesize your imprecise specs automatically, then you can actually improve learning even further. Uh, uh, okay, thanks. Uh, uh, the other question is, uh, I mean, you already found machine learning approach, you, uh, you'll be robust for, uh, I mean, noise from the data. So I wonder, in this case, is your approach be robust to the noise of data? Yeah, so, so the, the good thing about the search engine is that we can plug in any machine learning algorithm or uh, that was trained in uh, any large corporate, right? So, you could also not use that, right? You can just do random search, right? So if you would take out the machine learning, it still works. So even if you have, like, say, noisy data, or maybe you don't have enough data for, for you to guide your search, right? You may actually put some other heuristic there, right? For example, SAT solvers don't actually use machine learning. They just use some basically basic heuristics to bump some components or others. So you can use something more basic there as well. Uh, we're just using machine learning because if you have data, that, that's actually going to help you a lot. But if you don't have data, maybe you can actually plug in something else there. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Hi, thanks for the great talk. So it seemed like there were two things that you're doing sort of by hand here. And one of them is creating this, if I understand correctly, one of them is creating these specifications that if you have list.map, the size is going to be the same thing. And automating that, saying that for a given function we've never seen before is the size of the list going to change, that's sort of an open problem, but it's a well-defined problem. What seems less well-defined is saying, how do I figure out that this is a useful specification? That if I know that um, I, the list size doesn't change, I can use that in this synthesis. Is there any sort of formal theory or machine learning or statistics beyond, be, behind when you were deciding, you know, these are the properties that we should specify? Yeah, again, we didn't actually tune them, uh, but that's a good question. Uh, like, it's, it's how you would choose the specifications and how you choose the properties can actually have a large impact, right? So something that we observe is that, as you saw, all those specifications share the same property that ne neither of them increase the maximum, right? So they need to cluster in some sort of common property so that once you actually, the issue was because of that, then you can cut all the other components that have the same issue, right? So you want properties that are not too specific because if they are too specific, then you will not cluster anything, right? So you want properties that are general enough to cluster them into subgroups, but not too general that everything will be in the same group. So this, I would see that could be like an optimization problem, or how you actually come up with the subgroups that are maximal in, in between them, but the, also uh, dispersed enough that you have enough subgroups that are distinct. So I think that would be very interesting research as well there. Okay, so my understanding is you do have sort of a quantifiable, there's a question of how yeah. to get to the maximum, but mm -hmm. you do have a quantifiable, this is what clusters well. Yeah, at least we have some insights for that, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks. Exactly. 
Hi, thanks for the talk. I thought it was uh, provocative and interesting. Um, I have uh, two questions. So one, would it be possible, so you mentioned this issue with Saigus, yeah. would, it be, would it be possible for you to just do like an ablation study where you randomly eliminated parts of the specifications so you would have partial specifications from these things and then run your tool? Uh, yes, I mean like even, even with this, of course you can have the specification true, right? Which basically does nothing. Uh, so that means you're not pruning anything. Uh, so you can have, let's say, a very precise specification and you can remove things and you can see why is the impact of having more precise versus less precise. We didn't do actually like, I guess in prior work we did have a bit of like different degrees of, of specifications where you try to have more precise and we show that uh, you, if you have, of course, stronger specifications, you can actually prune more. But there's also a trade-off there. Like, let's say if I'm going to use, so all our specifications were using linear arithmetic, right? But you could use set theory or arrays or something else to actually right. describe. Right. Well, that's not really my question. My okay. question is just an empirical question. Oh. So, I mean, if you have Saigus benchmarks and the problem is, well, there's a total specification, mm -hmm. um, you can obviously turn, you could turn it into true, or you could just yeah. take parts of the specification if you have a disjunction yeah. and just drop uh, some clauses. Right, yep. so it seems like that's a nice way of getting a sense. Like, here's the full specification, mm -hmm. and you can at least say, well, with one fifth of the specifications, for example, we're able to synthesize this much, and so on and so forth. Yep. And that would allow you to to get a, a let's say, a more uh, rich understanding of like the effort that is involved and the trade offs that are entailed. All right, uh, so that's that's yeah. just one point. So the other one is, um, so you chose to cut everything off at five minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm a patient person. I'd wait longer. Uh, right, this thing is going to synthesize my whole program. I actually don't care if it finishes in five minutes. I mean, I can understand some people are impatient, but um, I would wait. I'd be happy to wait a day, two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so, how long did you try it? Why five minutes? And what happens if you have any data to these uh, these other solvers if you give them more time? Yeah. Um, so, why five minutes? I guess for a lot of synthesis problems, people actually want to have like uh, immediate response, or they don't want this, the synthesis to be too long. Uh, I do agree that for some issue, for some problems, maybe one, you, you can wait, right? So we did try it with longer timeouts. As you can see, when I said, well, this took 45 minutes before, and now it takes three, uh, three minutes, because actually, like, we try, like, for example, with an hour timeout, just to see, like, how, how would it scale, kind of, like, the, the other approaches, right? Uh, so, of course, this kind of, like, is a, you have, like, an exponential behavior, right? So usually what happens is that if you cannot solve it within a few minutes, it, it really will take a very, very long time to solve it. So like the difference between five minutes and let's say an hour, uh, it's not that much in terms of like how much you can solve more. Uh, for some, especially if you just do enumerative search, right? Uh, but if you do deduction, you could solve a bit more, but it will take just very, very long time, right? So we do have a bit of this, that study uh, like you described, but maybe we actually uh, taking consideration your suggestion about the cycles benchmarks and maybe like do, do a full study of scalability of like saying five minutes, 10 minutes, uh, an hour a day and just see what happens uh, to have a, a better understanding of, of the scalability of the system. Great. That would be great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, Zhixian from Nanyang University, China. So uh, I'm kind of familiar with the SAT problem itself. So that's why I'm curious about the, uh, like, actually the search part. Uh, so because, like, like the, in SAT, the decision is very important. You can choose different orders of decisions. That makes, uh, that will affect the, uh, I mean the the process a lot. So in your first part, you adopted the machine learning techniques. So I'm wondering uh, how do you do that uh, in more specific details? And also, so for example, if you decide the first node like uh, is a sum, and then when you decide the second node, do you consider the first one or just to do the second decision separately? Um, yeah, thank you. So. so uh, in our current system, we're actually using machine learning, so it depends on, on your algorithm, right? So, for example, if you're using n-grams, it will actually look at the, the previous nodes, right, to decide the next one. I see. Uh, for the neural network, it was not, we would not do that. We just basically choose what, what was the highest probability for the next node. So, it, it, it depends on which machine learning algorithm you're going to use, and that would actually then, of course, have different impacts on your, on our, on our, on our system. But okay. SATSolvers itself, they actually don't use machine learning algorithms. Just because the number of decisions we're making here, it's still like, it's not like millions per second. And in a SAT solver, it's much more robust and, and fast system where actually like the trade-off of plugging in a machine learning algorithm in a formula where there's no structure and you can't really learn much information, the benefit is not very much. But here, we do have benefits. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you very much.